It's Wednesday, May 4. In the headlines, Jamaica's sick profile numbers are alarming. New building codes coming soon. Regionally, CARICOM rejects recommendation of one-man commission. And in sports, Jamaica to face USA in CONCACAF Women's Under-17 Championship. This is the news on PBC Jamaica. I am Simone Absalom Gale. Jamaica has a sick profile which is alarming but can be corrected, so says Minister of Health and Wellness Dr. Christopher Tufton. Dr. Tufton says a large percent of Jamaicans have an NCD, a non-communicable disease or a significant risk factor such as high cholesterol, obesity or low physical activity. He said this as he gave his speech during the sectoral debate on Tuesday in the House of Representatives. Gabriel Thompson reports. In 2016-2017, Jamaica Health and Lifestyle Survey indicated that one in three persons aged 15 years and older were hypertensive, one in eight had diabetes, one in two was obese or overweight. Approximately eight out of ten Jamaicans had low levels of physical activity. These are trends born primarily out of historical lifestyle practices and it will take time and a number of policy prescription and the commitment of all of us here in this house in order to cauterize and to change those trends. The Health and Wellness Minister says while many are unaware and some just don't care, this must change as it affects all in the shared burden of health care costs. Quoting figures from the National Health Fund, Minister Tufton says we can't just throw money at the problem. A close look at the budget of the National Health Fund shows that costs have escalated by 139% between financial year 15 and 16 and financial year 21-22. 4.6 billion in 15-16 and 11 billion in the year 21-22. And this is adjusted for COVID expenses. So Madam Speaker, over that seven year period, we have seen an escalation of cost. The additional projection for the next three years, which I've asked the health economists to give an indication based on where we're coming from, based on the trends, suggests that we will need another 30% or so increase over that period. He broke down where most of the money is being spent. In 2020 to 2021, the NHF spent $1.275 billion on hypertension drugs compared to $940 million over the 2014-2015 period. In 2020-21, the organization spent $1.411 billion on diabetes compared to $887 million in 2014-2015, a 59% increase. Wow. Madam Speaker, rising health costs are not just hitting us as a collective, as taxpayers, but it's also hitting us as individual householders, eroding our disposable income. In fact, the economic impact of rising health costs is absolutely devastating and projected to get worse. Minister Tufton says that even pharmaceuticals are up. And I'm just taking out 10 of the critical pharmaceuticals. There was an increase in the price of these drugs, Madam Speaker, between 2017 to 2022. Eight of the 10 drugs under consideration had price increases of more than 100% over the review period. Examples of the variation is commonly in commonly used pharmaceuticals include paracetamol, 785% increase, dextrose, 5% in normal saline, 87% increase and morphine powder, 117% increase. Madam Speaker, this is absolutely unsustainable. Dr. Tofton notes that it is important to restructure the health system now to achieve a more sustainable mechanism and identify how it will be financed. In the coming months, Madam Speaker, I intend to unveil a discussion paper, ministry paper, on sustainable financing options for our health system and embark on a series of consultations within government and the country, as well as with our multilateral partners around healthcare financing. This is a follow-on, Madam Speaker, on the Green Paper 
on a national health insurance plan that was stabled back in 2019, which was not pursued as desired due to the priorities of COVID. Madam Speaker, I have appointed Dr. Damian King, an economist and executive director of CAPRI, who was the chair of the National Health Insurance uh, Working Group, which led to that Green Paper, to lead the national discussion on the current challenges we are facing with health financing and implications for poverty and the economic and social advancement of Jamaicans. 65% of our children between the ages of 13 to 17 are overweight and 26% are obese. This, according to the Global School Health Survey. We have to curb this trend. Uh, this year, we will seek to table and to launch, this is myself and my colleague, Minister of Education and Youth, new policies and laws around food options in our schools through the soon to be implemented school nutrition policy to keep our children healthy and over time help them to develop habits around consuming more vegetables, drinking more water as opposed to sugary drinks. The policy proposal has passed through the stages of internal consultation and is to go before cabinet as a green paper, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, we will work to guide and mandate, in some cases, our school cafeterias to prepare healthier options for our children. Yes, yes, we must yes. help our children to develop healthier habits, and the school environment, Madam Speaker, is the best place to start. While noting that there were challenges with the sugary drink restrictions in schools due to the disruption of face-to-face -face learning, Minister Tufton assured the public that this is a priority as well as programs will be happening to get children more active. There is an inspection that is now taking place by the parish health offices among all schools. The minister and I are involved in that process and having once that is completed, we will again resume strict instructions and enforcement around ensuring that the sugary drink restrictions in schools are maintained, are established and maintained, Madam Speaker, and that's a commitment that we are making here today. Additionally, now that schools are reopened, we will also see another collaboration with the Ministry of Education and Youth, which is the rollout of the Jamaica Moves in Schools program to get our children active as part of their wellness program. The Minister of State and the Ministry of Health and Wellness, the Honourable Juliet Cuthbert Flynn, will lead this initiative, and there is nobody who can lead this initiative better than her. The police force is working to stem the incidence of crime and violence in Western Jamaica with the establishment of operational and quick response support to its troops stationed there. Police Commissioner Major General Anthony Anderson shared some plans during a virtual press conference on Tuesday. Western Jamaica is uh, the area that where we see, not only in St. James, but it also in Westmoreland. So we're really seeing it uh, down there. It's, it is what is accounting for our increase. To that extent, we are um, developing an uh, operational support team at the area level, uh, quite a strong team that is scheduled to, to join them down there to increase their capacity to, to mount an operational response. And at the moment, we have a, another set of officers going through quick response motorcycle training to shore up there and other places across the country. The police commissioner says the main source of funding for criminal gangs comes from drug trafficking, lottery scamming and extortion. He says they have increased collaboration with FID, Customs and the Jamaica Defence Force as well as international partners. Just last week, the police seized thousands of U.S. and Canadian dollars linked to narcotics. During the operation, a vehicle was intercepted and upon search, cocaine weighing 11 kilos with a street value of Jamaican $88 million was found. One person remains in custody and the interview process continues as part of the investigation. The JCF head says the seizure is as a result of diligent police work. It was one of the largest seizures in our policing history, and I can assure you that while others may not be as large, there will be more. 
The Bureau of Standards Jamaica, BSJ, is in the process of upgrading the country's building codes to further support quality assurance in the construction sector. This comes against the background of a boom in the sector and the influence of varying construction systems from across the globe. Manager of the Testing and Industrial Services Branch at the BSJ, Richard Lawrence, says the new codes will be made public soon. We have promulgated the National Building Code way back in 2007. We are upgrading the codes and in the, in the months to come, we will have a public campaign on the contents of the new code as well as training for regulators, professionals in usage of these codes. Jamaica is open and ready to welcome you. This was the message delivered by Prime Minister Andrew Holness as he spoke to the morning hosts of Fox 5 New York. The Prime Minister stressed that while most restrictions are lifted, it is up to the person to take special care of their well-being. We have, uh, it, we are insisting in, within the, the island that people take personal responsibility for their own health and safety. Uh, we strongly encourage people to wear masks, sanitize, social distance, uh, but we have no uh, protocols enforced by law anymore. So you can travel to Jamaica quite easily. Persons traveling to Jamaica are no longer required to present a negative COVID-19 test three days ahead of arrival on the island. It's also no longer mandatory to wear a mask in enclosed public spaces, but persons are, however, still expected to isolate once they test positive for COVID-19. And establishments and entities are required to provide sanitization and temperature checks on premises. Time now for the business report with Danita Rodney. Studies have shown that Jamaica is one of the leading Caribbean countries in establishing a strong national quality infrastructure, NQI, which is a framework through which goods and services produced and traded in the country are declared fit for consumption or use in the marketplace. One entity that makes its work possible is the Bureau of Standards Jamaica, BSJ, which assists local businesses with their growth and trade. Manager of Communication and Customer Service at the BSJ, Maxine Fagan, told JIS News that, quote, We recognize the importance of providing support as we seek to enhance businesses and execute our mandate and role as a significant player in the national quality infrastructure of Jamaica, end quote. Ms. Fagan also highlighted that the BSJ supports all industry sectors and encourage businesses to engage with the BSJ and experience the benefits offered, such as their testing services and their training and industry support programs. Now for your market updates. In foreign exchange trading for Tuesday, March 3, the US dollar sold for an average of $155.38. The Canadian dollar ended trading at $121.34. The pound sterling traded for $194.04. And the euro sold for an average of $164.93. The following reflects the movement of the GSE indices in Tuesday's trading session. The GSE index declined by 256 points to close at over 300,000 units. The junior market index declined by 33 points to close at over 4,000 units. The combined market index declined by 533 points to close at over 400,000 units. And the All Jamaican Composite Index declined by 305 points to close at over 400,000 units. Overall market activity resulted from trading in 113 stocks of which 44 advanced, 53 declined and 16 traded firm. Stocks advanced for 138 Student Living Jamaica Limited Verba Preference, 1834 Investments Limited and Access Financial Services Limited. Stocks declined for 138 Student Living Jamaica Limited, Berger Pains Jamaica Limited and Caribbean Cement Company Limited. Trading firm were Barita Investments Limited, Cargo Handlers Limited and the First Rock Capital Holdings Limited USD. The following companies represent the overall volume leaders. Spiritry Spices Jamaica Limited, Future Energy Source Company Limited Ordinary Shares and Wigton Winform Limited Ordinary Shares with over 2 million units. 
in regional stocks in Trinidad and Tobago, Clico Investment Fund was the sole security trading over 55,000 shares. On the Barbados Stock Exchange, Epley Caribbean Property Fund Value Fund was the volume leader with over 14,000 shares. The European Union has proposed a complete ban on Russian oil imports by the end of this year because of the war in Ukraine. Al Jazeera's Dominique Kane reports. This is the Gazprom Neft installation in Khantimansiysk. From installations like these in Siberia and across Russia, crude oil, diesel and petrol are pumped to customers. Taken together, every day nearly 8 million barrels of crude and refined products are exported. Two-thirds of them end up in Europe. But now, Russia's war against Ukraine has changed everything. Today, we are addressing our dependency on Russian oil. And let's be clear, it will not be easy because some member states are strongly dependent on Russian oil, but we simply have to do it. So today we will propose to ban all Russian oil from Europe. This will be... <laughs> this will be a complete import ban on all Russian oil seaborne and pipeline, crude and refined. In market data for oil, oil prices jumped this morning after the European Union announced plans to phase out imports of Russian oil, offsetting demand worries in top importer China. Brent crude futures rose $3.99 or 3.8% to $108.96 a barrel and West Texas Intermediate crude rose $4.05 or 4% to $106.46 a barrel. And that was the business report on PBCJ. I I am Danita Rodney. In regional news, the 15-member Caribbean community CARICOM grouping on Tuesday said it is, quote, deeply concerned, end quote, at the recommendations by a one-man commission of inquiry that called for the British Virgin Islands government to cease to exist in its current format for at least two years. The move means ministerial government and an elected House of Assembly would no longer hold authority in the territory and London will call the shots. In a statement, CARICOM said it has taken, quote, note of the release on April 29, 2022 of the report of the British Virgin Islands Commission of Inquiry with its far-reaching recommendations, end quote. The regional body said such moves would represent a, quote, retrograde step of restoring direct rule by the governor in council as existed in Her Majesty's colonies during the colonial period. CARICOM supports the BVI government and the people in their objection to this recommendation, end quote. On Tuesday, people took to the streets outside of the official residence of the governor to protest the recommendations. The British Virgin Islands has been an associate member of the grouping since July 1991. Speaking at a national media conference on Tuesday, President Ali of Guyana assured members of the media community and citizens that the government is not spying on them. More from news source Guyana. President Irfan Ali opened a national media conference this morning and gave the assurance that his government is not spying and will never spy on journalists or any other citizen. The president gave the assurance after the Ghana Press Association warned media houses to guard themselves against spyware that could be used to track their movements and contacts. The GPA requested that the government assures that there is no such activity taking place locally. The president said it will never happen under his government. This government has no intention whatsoever. It is not, it is not even contemplated my mind to move in any direction, to have any spyware or wireware or anything to, to, to spy on anyone. That is, a, that is farthest from my thought. I have not even imagined something like that. So take it out, take it out even your imagination now. It will never happen, at least under this government. President Ali said he does not believe any government should be spying on its citizens and it is something that his government will never do. No government must be spying on their population, none. Not in the democratic construct of a free society. Not in a democratic construct. So, please, don't let the imaginative 
thought process enter mainstream communication where it doesn't exist. The president also said his government respects the work and role of the media, even when it is facing criticism from the very media. He called for responsible reporting and noted that the media has an important role to play, bridging the gap between citizens and their leaders and providing them with accurate information. Responsibility is a heavy weight. It's a heavy weight. But responsibility must be carried. Understanding. But you can't be responsible if you don't have decency. If there is no decency in reporting, if there is no standard and values by which you're holding yourself accountable, then you will never be responsible because you will believe you can write whatever you want because I have a newspaper, I own a newspaper, or I have a pen and a paper, or a TV station, or something, I can... I'm the Ghana Press Association, in its World Press Freedom Day message, said the association is urging journalists to be wary of what they download and from which sources on their mobile phones and other electronic devices, as such acts can potentially install spyware that can access their information and contacts. According to the GPA, media houses should of necessity take the requisite action to minimize the surveillance and monitoring of their work in violation of the freedom to receive and impart ideas. It was noted that state intelligence gathering agents no longer have to monitor journalists and media houses around the world by their physical presence, since that can now be done using spyware to ascertain the sources for journalists and to also impose sanctions and take other actions against those sources and journalists themselves. This year's World Press Freedom Day was observed under the theme Journalism Under Digital Siege. The Prime Minister of St. Lucia, Philippe Pierre, is pushing back against critics in the opposition UWP who are questioning his SLP administration's policies to counter rising fuel prices. He's labeled the rhetoric as deceptive and misleading. Pierre insists that his administration continues to count its losses while absorbing most of the costs of skyrocketing fuel prices through subsidies. HTS News Force has the report. There was another hike in the cost of fuel products as an increase in the price of diesel, kerosene and cooking gas was announced on May 2nd. One gallon of kerosene is now $14.03. One gallon of diesel is now $16.23, while a 20-pound cylinder is $42.93. A 22-pound cylinder is $47.23, and a 100-pound cylinder is $341.16. The press corps sought comment ahead of the weekly cabinet briefing from Finance Minister and Prime Minister Philip J. Pierre. Surprised at why we haven't seen the reality of the situation in St. Lucia. There is no country where the price of gas has not increased. Now, I'm not happy about it, but for, to take the position where you blame the government for the increase in the price of gas, it's almost, I, I, I don't want to use a word that I want to describe it. Because every, the price gas in the U.S. is the highest it has ever been. The current administration has come under fire from the opposition United Workers' Party for what the UWP claims is the lack of a robust response to the mounting cost of fuel products. However, Pierre counters that his administration has done all within its power to cushion the blow of fuel prices. It's a simple fact that the supply of petrol, of, of gas, is limited. I've said before that we only, the revenue from gas is only 80 cents. With the new price of diesel, we make zero cents on diesel. Absolutely zero cents on diesel. And we are subsidizing cooking gas by over twenty dollars, I think twenty three dollars to be So I mean, people can be can play the politics, but it it's almost I don't want to use the word to be deliberately misleading people on something you know you cannot change. We have about surpluses of what the revenue of the country has not reached the twenty nineteen levels. 
So there are no surpluses. Pierre says that the island is running on a deficit on its current accounts. No economist, no politician who can tell me that they can subs continue to subsidize gas more than we're doing it. So, I mean, I, I must answer you, but it's almost heartbreaking. Many people just deliberately misleading people like that. It's sad. We have a country to run. The election is over. As I said, we've won the elections. Nothing has changed that. The people have voted us in the government, and we've run the country. So even though you, there's no, all the misleading and the destabilizing, doesn't make sense. We have a country to run. So, so does that mean the, um, the minibus drivers will be getting the increase? I am, we've told you before that the minibus drivers are in discussions with the Minister of Transportation. I must applaud them for the way they've been, been very mature in these discussions. Because the minibus drivers understand the reality of the situation in the country. Everybody understands it. It's not, it's not unique to St. Lucia. We're not, we're not reinventing the wheel here. This is you, this is the whole world. Gasoline has never been much in the entire world. What are you supposed to do in St. Lucia? So it's, it's almost wicked when people try to use gasoline to make a political statement. The Prime Minister has called for an end to what he deems the deceptive and misleading narratives surrounding the rising cost of fuel products. Solish Alfred, HTS News Force. Calls continue in St. Kitts and Nevis for Prime Minister Dr. Timothy Harris to resign. Members of the ruling team Unity Coalition have both written to the Governor General and filed a motion of no confidence in the federal parliament in an effort to force the Prime Minister to step aside. Premier of St. Kitts and Nevis and Minister of Foreign Affairs Mark Brantley explains the issues within the coalition of a three-party system. From what he says, the Prime Minister has failed to uphold the coalition agreement, including the economic development of the island of Nevis and a limit of two terms for a Prime Minister. They have some core principles. One, that we would have two-term limits. No leader would be allowed to serve more than two terms. Two, that the island of Nevis would be given its appropriate share of certain national resources. Those are two fundamental principles. There are other principles, of course, about good governance, agenda, greater transparency. We promised electoral reform. We promised constitutional reform. We started to display some attitudes. We tried our very best to curb those internally, to have discussions internally. But we soon realized that he was intent on using the office of the prime minister and the various ministries that he controls to augment and build the PLP at the expense of the other coalition partners. We have engaged privately, we have spoken quietly, and uh, sadly these issues were not resolved. Premier Brantley says the coalition partners will support Deputy Prime Minister Sean Richards becoming Prime Minister, and further noted the new administration will continue the work of the day and will seek to implement their agenda. In sports, Jamaica will have to literally pull out all the stops when they face the reigning champions, United States, in the quarterfinals of the CONCACAF Women's Under-17 Championship today, Wednesday, May 4, at the Pan American Stadium in San Cristobal. The Jamaicans reached the quarterfinals after they beat Cuba 4-0 in the preliminary stage of the finals last Sunday. The Rega girls were a close second behind Canada in Group F and will need to rekindle some of that form when they meet the Americans. The Caribbean side is brimming with confidence, thanks in part to Natoya Atkinson and her five goals. They'll be hoping she can be the spark that ignites their offense. The United States have four clean sheets so far and have outscored their opponents 49-0, including 11-0 triumph over QSO in the preliminary stage. Wrapping up the day at the Pan American Stadium will be a contest between Canada and Costa Rica beginning the day at the Felix Sanchez Olympic Stadium in the capital will be a scintillating affair between high-flying Mexico and hosts the Dominican Republic. The second match of the day at the Sanchez Stadium will be an enticing duel between Puerto Rico and El Salvador. And that's the news on PBC Jamaica. Thanks so very much for watching.